702. The Naked Scientist. For the Naked Scientist with Dr. Chris Smith. Dr. Chris, we're so excited to have you here. We had to introduce you twice. I got that. I was impressed. <laughs> So, um, opening up the lines, 11 883 and the WhatsApp line, 72 for all of your science-related questions for the doctor. Now, doctor, I did give you some homework. So, the question is this. How does the gel work when it comes to men's contraceptive that is currently in development? How does it work in terms of actually preventing... Uh, pregnancies or yes you know right there's a couple of approaches here yes. and um, one of them is something the men can do one of them is something that the women can do in terms of what the men can do and in terms of what's already being explored in recent years scientists have discovered that there are certain substances which if you inject them into the the vas deferens and these are the tubes that connect the testes up into the inside of the body you can form a sort of plug with the stuff that solidifies into a gel in those tubes and it stops any sperm going anywhere and it stays like that for as long as it takes you to then come back and inject something else that would dissolve it. Mm -hmm. So one way, instead of having the tubes actually cut, which is what are done in a vasectomy, where you actually go in and you ligate and then cut the tubes to Mm -hmm. stop the sperm from progressing where they're being made up into the body where they can then be ejaculated, you actually put this temporary blockage of this gel. There are other ways of doing this now as well. They're not in clinical practice yet. These are all experimental, but there are other ways of doing it where you have gels that you can put inside the woman, which also immobilize the sperm on their way in. And a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to a lady called Melanie Baalbach, who is at um, one of the American institutions, and she's just published an exciting paper where they have found the off switch on sperm. And what they're able to do is give a drug which was being investigated as part of a slew of ways of looking at various things that might affect the sperm in a a body. And this drug they can give, if you give it to mice, within about an hour of you giving it, it throws the off switch on sperm so that when they do leave the body, they're totally unable to turn themselves on and swim. Mm -hmm. But it's reversible. So as soon as this stuff wears off, which takes a matter of hours, then full activity returns to the sperm and they become fully fertile again. And in experiments on mice, what they're able to do is put these mice which have been treated with female mice where they would normally very quickly produce lots of offspring and for 24 hours there are there, there are multiple matings. In the first nine hours of the after the administration of the drug, they get no babies. You then wait 24 hours and you get babies again. So it looks like it works very well and they're now beginning to, to explore whether this will work in, in humans. So... Mm watch this space, I guess, is the bottom line with both of these ideas. Indeed. Thank you so much for doing your homework so diligently, Dr. Chris Smith. And now we take some calls. We have Karen in Midrand. Hi, Karen. Hello, I'm Haley and Dr. Chris. Yes. Um, it's a question um, on men whilst urinating always spit, or is it just man? <laughs> <laughs> um, he uh, tells me can't comment. all of them do oh, he, is that what he says because I think we can yeah. add a very long list of men things that men say that they all do but maybe don't actually do oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Dr. Christmas uh, is, it, is it a real thing that men spit while urinating or is it just Corin's man this one doesn't, and that sounds revolting. I, I think the temptation is that when you're standing at a urinal, then if you do have something that you want to spit out and you're thinking, well, that's a drain, I might as well spit it in there. There is a sort of temptation if you're going to spit anyway, you might as well spit where something else is, is going to go down the drain. So that may be part of it, but certainly it's not universal. And um, when one visits the facilities in my hospital and finds themselves some, you know, not bedfellows, but urinary, urinary neighbours, as it were. Uh, the people next door to me have never hawked up a big sort of load of phlegm and spat it out. I've never had that happen. <laughs> I, I hope they don't either. So we'll talk about the toilet seat being left up another day and to see if it's some men or all men. Paul in Soweto, hi. Hi, Paul. Hi, I'm listening Yes, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Chris. Hello. Yes, my question is, uh, is the F uh, flat or round? 
Hello, Paul. Um, one word answer, round, like a sphere. Um, Paul, uh, do you still yeah. have do you still have doubts about the the Earth being round? Yes, yes. Because, uh, personally, I I believe the Earth is flat. Mm, is it because? Or, or share with us why you think the Earth is flat. Because uh, one, uh, on the on the on the flat earth, mm-hmm. look at the shadows in the morning. The the shadows in the morning. Yes, when the sun rises, the mm-hmm. your shadows uh, actually uh, fall to the to to the west. Mm-hmm. Now on a round earth, your shadows wouldn't do that. So can I ask you a question, Paul? If the yes. if the earth is flat. Which country is the beginning and which country is the end? I, I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul, if one looks up in the sky and you look at the moon, what shape is the moon? Paul? Well, it looks round to me. Right. So why is the moon round if the earth is flat? And if the earth is flat, how does the moon go round the earth? Because it takes the moon a month to go all the way around the earth. So... How does it do that if the Earth is flat? And why is the moon a round ball if it's flat? And the sun is round. Paul, can I make a suggestion? You need to leave that Flat Earth Society Facebook group. <laughs> Are you in that Facebook group, <laughs> Paul? No, 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 no. That's my personal uh, uh, opinion. I understand. I understand. Maybe, Dr. Chris, I mean, we, we, we may laugh about it, but there are many people who advocate for the conversation that the earth is flat. Maybe instead of sharing all of the scientific proof, share with us from your experience why you think people would choose to believe the earth is flat. Like what would be the benefit of the earth being flat for us to want to believe that as truth? Well, we exist in an environment that to us looks flat. And it's only when one gets off the surface of the Earth and goes up into space that you can truly see it's a ball because we've evolved to deal with things that are near to us, that we can relate to in in size terms. And the far horizon is so far away that we struggle to comprehend that it can possibly be curving. And then one thinks, well, if the Earth is a ball, why am I not upside down when I'm at the bottom of it or Mm -hmm. the other way up when I'm on the top? And so all these things kind of contrast and contradict what we intuitively think should be happening about the Earth on a small scale. Because if, if the Earth was a very small ball and we went to the bottom of it, then obviously you would be upside down. But the Earth is a huge ball. And it curves so slowly that by the time you get to the bottom of it, it still looks flat to you because all the bits that you're standing on at that moment in time look completely flat. So Mm. it's because people end up with this internal argument between what their eyes appear to be telling them and what other people are saying is actually true. And they think, well, I believe my own eyes. I don't believe what other people say. The earth must therefore be flat. Um, It's not flat. The earth is a ball. And the reason that you are on your mobile phone or watching satellite TV or the moon goes around the earth, the earth goes around the sun, all in big circles is because these things are balls and you can have a satellite going around a ball. A satellite would not be able to go around something flat because as you quite rightly said, if the earth were flat like a map rolled out, Mm. then how on earth would you fly from one side of the earth to the other side of the earth and then come back a different way? You couldn't do it. Mm. So that's why the earth is not flat. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Paul Insoito, for your question. Mohale in Rand Park Ridge, hi. Hi, Lewis, how are you? Good, thanks, and you? Good, good, thanks. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a well-behaved gentleman, well-raised, well-mannered, and as a result, I tend to listen to classic music, you know, your R&D, your soul mm. kind of chilled music. And then on the opposite of that, you find other people prefer more hard rock, metal, loud music. So is there a science behind certain people liking certain genres of music and others preferring the other? Oh, that's a good one, Mohale. Mm, I bet he doesn't spit in the lavatory either, <laughs> do you? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. The now we to have to ask is, all is of almost, the men just yeah, to yeah. help Karen the women. win her argument with her husband. <laughs> Thank you. It's an equal opportunities program, this. So, uh, you know, we'll ask the ladies as well. Um, Do you spit, uh, Lebo, when when you're in the loo? Do you you spit? Definitely. I don't even do it in the shower. (laughs) 
because the shower would be such an opportune moment. But what I can believe is men do spit a lot more often than women because you see it on the soccer, on the soccer field all the time. And I'm like, that is so gross. Why are you doing this? Is it helping the grass? Does it help you win? Like, I don't get it. But yes, let's... Uh, uh, well, the I suppose part- it will help the grass, won't it? Because <laughs> it, it's water. There's some. There's definitely some other nutrients in there because it's quite protein rich. So there's some nitrogen in in the saliva. Because what makes the saliva all gooey is various proteins that your body's secreted into it. So in some respects, it is a sort of fertilizer. But you're quite right. It's revolting. We shouldn't do it. In terms of music and musical taste, this is very much probably a, a, a situation where you've got a number of things at play. One is individuality. Everyone is different. And we have all been brought up differently. We've all had a different existence. We've all eaten differently, lived differently, traveled differently, been exposed to different things. And we all have things that we like and dislike, whether it's music, food, your favorite color. It doesn't matter. We're all all individuals. And therefore, we all tend to settle on things that we are comfortable with and which really press our buttons and that we really like or we really dislike. Mm. So on the one hand, it's, it's individuality. On the other hand, I think probably your nurture plays a very big role here because you don't know that you like something unless you've tried it therefore the opportunity to try things and the opportunity to do different things is very important in order to widen your repertoire of things that you like or dislike because until you've tried a you don't know that you don't like a Mm. or b or c whereas if you have a very broad repertoire of things to fall back on you will be able to make a choice which is perhaps a bit different than someone who's not been exposed to classical music or that kind of thing And personality does play a certain extent a role in that as well. Seeking out novelty is a personality trait, so that may also play into it. But really having the opportunity to experience all these different genres and then deciding from a broader pool what you do and don't like, I think Mm. that's also critical here. Okay, thank you, Mohale, for that question. Lerato in Rustenburg, hi. Hello. Yes. Uh, hi, Dr. Chris. Hi, hi, I, I would like to know this, this question got me going. Mm. Uh, if you're standing in, in space and you're watching the Earth and it's raining maybe or snowing from the, on the North Pole, um, it's ra- raining from the top. So what about the South Pole? Is it raining from the bottom? <laughs> well, the answer is that when you're on the Earth's surface, Because the distance to the horizon is 1.24 times the square root of the height of your eyes above the ground in feet, which usually ends up being several miles or kilometers away, the Earth looks flat. But when you're out in space, it is a giant ball, and you can see that it's a giant ball. But what you're seeing is the Earth from, if you're on the International Space Station, about 600 kilometers up. So the resolution of your view is quite limited from that, even that altitude. And so although you can see storm systems, massive great cloud banks and so on, it's much more difficult to resolve what those storms are actually doing because most of the light is being reflected off back into space. The reason a black cloud looks black and you think, oh, there's lots of rain in there, it's going to rain really hard in a minute, look at those clouds, is they look black because the clouds have reflected a lot of light that would have come to that patch of the sky back into space, making the cloud less bright, therefore it looks dark to our eyes. But you can't tell whether it's actually raining from space because all you're seeing is the reflection from the top of the clouds. And you can see some enormous storms. I remember when I've been traveling to South Africa and you can look down as you fly down the spine of Africa. You can see all the storm systems below you, especially if you do this in the rainy season. And you can also see lightning storms and electrical storms and things jumping through the clouds below you. But you've no idea what the weather is like on the ground because you're only seeing it what it looks like from above. And also the earth is the radius of the earth between where you are and uh, where the core of the Earth is, is 6,000 kilometres. So the distance between the North Pole and the South Pole is 12,000 kilometres, and approximately. And so therefore what the weather's doing in the North Pole is completely different to what's happening in the South Pole because the planet is so big and weather systems happen on a much more local basis. So therefore, and then the geography is completely different as well. The South Pole is very isolated, a continent completely surrounded by oceans, which has quite subtle and important influences on weather systems down there. So what happens in the North, although they're both cold, is quite different from what happens in the South. Thank you so much, Lerato, for your question. And we have received some voice notes. Hi, uh, Dr. Chris. The Earth is definitely flat. 
70% of the earth is made up of water, which is non-carbonized. That, that would make the earth flat. Andre from White River. Thanks. Bye. So I'm going to ask you this, Dr. Chris. Are there any scientists who have presented evidence that the earth is flat? Or is it only no. individuals who have a passion for believing the earth is flat that advocate for the earth being flat? Okay, instead of saying, is the earth flat or not, let's say, is Elvis alive? Now, yes. you could say there's the conspiracy theory about Elvis is still lurking in Memphis somewhere, and in fact, he's very much alive, and the it's same all as been made up that Elvis is dead. The same as and, and exactly the same thing applies. Yes. And, and it's, it's, I could say that, and, uh, and I could say, I believe that Elvis is alive. Mm. And it doesn't mean that it's true. It just means my personal speculation is it's true. But it's completely at odds with all of the established knowledge we have o- on the subject. Same with this. When we actually go and look for ourselves, we see that the Earth is clearly a ball hovering in space. When we look at the moon, it's a ball. When we look at the other planets in our solar system, and we know what they look like because we've been there, they're round. And the rules of physics explain to us how something like a planet forms and why it would have the shape that it would. The fact that you can board an aircraft, take off in one country, fly continuously as world record breakers have, and come back to where you started would not be possible with an Earth that were flat. So really, this is just one of those bits of misinformation promulgated, largely exacerbated by social media, that is a good story in the telling, gets everyone talking, but in fact is completely wrong. So I think the the, the flight one is is a great example. So if you taking a standard Boeing and you you do a Cape Town to Cape Town flight, how long would that take? Because in essence, if it were flat, you would eventually have to f- fly underneath the earth upside down. E- exactly right. <laughs> so yeah. maybe, yeah. And in fact, if you, if you look at some of these people who've done it by air balloon, we've had circumnavigations by hot air balloon where they've never touched ground. They've, they've gone continuously all the way around satellites continuously go all the way around and if you talk to the astronauts on the international space station Mm -hmm. they are making a lap of the earth every 90 minutes now they wouldn't better do that if the earth was flat i'm sighing but at the same time i also appreciate the passion that we all have as individuals to believe what we would like to so continue to advocate for your dreams but also guys let's read let's read thank you so much dr chris smith